Just like the T14 Armata itself, the engine that powers the tank is very controversial, especially its history, which many people got very very wrong. Today we will take a deep dive at this engine and see what is it that got so many people confused about it, what is the actual history of this engine and what is its future. You have most likely heard of this controversy, it is most likely why you clicked on this video. There have been so many people talking about how the engine of T14 Armata, the A85 3A, is a copy of a World War II German SLA-16 engine. And at the first glance, without looking much into it, that might appear to be the case. Those are both powerful X-layout diesel engines, which is very unique since most diesel engines are V-layout. And these are probably the only X-layout engines for tanks that were actually used, or rather planned to be used. But the more you look into it, the more and more you realize that these engines are nothing alike. The origins of this controversy are silly to say the least. From what I could find, at first it started by some Russian bloggers vaguely mentioning that the two engines are connected. Then a Russian Top War clickbait article about Armata came out, where they had a lot of questionable takes. Among which is that the T-14 Armata's engine is a copy of the World War II German engine and it has actually been made to power oil stations. We'll get to this other one later. Then some English articles started popping up, which were pretty much just translations of the Russian one, which got the attention of the international audience, where then we had such claims become even more popular on YouTube, reaching millions of people and causing even more controversy. And that puts us where we are now where I'm going to explain to you why the engine of T-14 Armata, the a 85 a is not a copy of the Simmering SLA-16 engine. The main sources I will be using for this section are the Field Information Agency report on the Simmering engine and the Vesnik Issue 4 of 1979, each describing one engine. I will probably also be referencing some other sources, so I will just leave a link to all of these in the description. Before I go into the details, let me just quickly explain some basic elements of engines, in case someone watching it doesn't know these things. Each engine has banks where pistons lie. These engines have four banks because they are X layout engines. Pistons have connecting rods that connect the piston to the crankshaft. Crankshaft is the part that converts the reciprocation of the piston into a rotational motion. Crankshaft has cranks and crank pins to which the connecting rods of the pistons are held. Ok, now we can continue. In the SLA-16 report, we have a good look at the engine's structure, which gives us a lot of valuable information. First, we can see that the pistons are connected to the crankshaft with one big master rod and three slave rods, which means that four pistons are connected to one crank pin on the crankshaft which in turn means that the crankshaft has four pins on it to which the pistons are connected to, since the SLA-16 is a 16-cylinder engine. This is further confirmed by the pictures of the crankshaft we have of the SLA-16, where we can also see it is a journal-bearing crankshaft. Now, because four pistons are connected to one pin on the crankshaft, that means that the banks are perfectly parallel to each other. What I mean is that the pistons on one side are parallel to the pistons on the opposite side. The situation is very different in the A85 engine. It should be noted that the A85 is a member of the 2V family of engines, where we have a 16-cylinder, 12-cylinder, 8-cylinder and 6-cylinder engines. A85 is a 12-cylinder engine, 2V12. Now, the part of the Vestnik I will be referencing is written by Butov, the designer of the 2V engines, together with some of his colleagues. In the Vestnik, he describes the working of the engines and shows the diagrams of their construction and gives us information about the piston arrangement. I will try to sum it up in the best way possible. In the diagrams and in the description of the firing order of pistons, we have a bunch of numbers, including Roman numerals. In the footnote, it says that the Arabic numbers are the cranks on the crankshaft and the Roman numerals are the banks or the rows of the cylinders. With that, we can determine that the 12-cylinder engine has 6 cranks, which means 6 crank pins, and the 16-cylinder one has 8, two times more than the SLA-16 engine, which has the same number of cylinders. On the diagrams, we also have the bank angles. You will notice that the angles are different on the 16 and the 12-cylinder variant, 
and the 16-cylinder engine has the same bank angles as the SLA-16. But it is stated that by calculations, those are the most optimal angles for engines with these amount of cylinders, so it's just the most optimal way to make such engines and does not indicate anything. Now back to the pistons. In the description of the firing order we can come to the conclusion that the pistons on one side are connected together in a V-shape to the crank pin on the crankshaft. How do we conclude that? Well, if we take into account that cranks are marked with Arabic numbers and each bank is marked with a Roman numeral, we can see that the crank number 1 connects rows 1 and 2, crank pin number 2 connects rows 3 and 4, crank pin number 3 connects rows 1 and 2, crank pin number 4 connects rows 3 and 4, 5 connects rows 1 and 2, and the 6, 3 and 4. Same situation with the 16 cylinder variant, just with more pistons and pins. If we look at the diagrams, we can also come to the same conclusion. We can see cranks 1, 3 and 5 connecting the rows on the left, the first and the second row, and the cranks 2, 4 and 6 connect the third and the fourth rows. The reason why they are drawn like this is because that is the position of the pins on the crankshaft. Number 1 is on the top, 2 is on the bottom, 3 on the bottom right, 4 is top left, you get the idea. What all of this means is that, unlike the SLA-16, the two banks are not parallel to each other. One is slightly offset in comparison to the other one, in order to be able to fit the cylinders and have them connect to the crankshaft, since they connect to different pins. You might say, that's old info, the engine might have changed since then. Well, no. If you look at the pictures of the modern A85 3A, we can see that the opposing piston chambers are offset to each other. Here, we can see that this chamber is at the very front, while there is a gap before the opposing one, and the name 2V stems from the fact that the engines are made to be like two V engines connected together. So by all accounts, it is pretty much confirmed that the pistons are connected in a V shape to a single crank pin on the crankshaft. Now what about the crankshaft itself? Well, luckily we have a lot of info on the 6 cylinder variant, the 2V6, which is a V layout engine on the same family based on the 2V12. We have 3D diagrams of the engine including the crankshaft as well as the actual pictures of it, where we can see that it is a tunnel crankshaft. It has such name because it requires a tunnel in the crankcase of the engine to be fit inside. On top of that, we have Butov's patent from the early 80s for a tunnel crankshaft, most definitely intended for the 2V family, since those are the engines he designed and worked on. And if all of this wasn't enough, well, the Russians have released some images of the A85-3A engine parts, including the piston connecting rods and the crankshaft. In the pictures, we can see that the connecting rods indeed are in a V layout and feature the same kind of setup as the 2V series of engines. So if anything, they copied this from their already existing V2 series of engines. We can tell they belong to the A85 engine because these parts are marked with Armata, while the V2 parts are marked with Cyrillic V. And in another picture, we can see the crankshaft of the engine, confirming that it is indeed a tunnel crankshaft. And we know it's a crankshaft of the A85 because they were only displaying the parts of the modernized V2 engines and the A85. And since the crankshaft of the V2 is not a tunnel crankshaft, this has to only be the crankshaft of the A85. The V2 crankshaft was also displayed next to it. We can see it visible in the picture with the connecting rods. But since we don't have the wide shot of everything, it might not be visible at the first glance. And the last thing is the cooling. SLA-16 and A85 have completely different types of cooling. SLA-16 is air-cooled, while A85 uses liquid cooling. The differences between the two types of cooling are pretty big. SLA-16 needs gaps and special designs for airflow in order to cool properly. We can also see on the crankcase design that there is quite a big space between the piston chambers. That is most likely done for better air circulation around the engine. Liquid cooling on the other hand requires chambers where the liquid would flow through around the engine to cool it properly. Therefore, the entire body of the engine must be different. So, based on the piston connection and layout, different crankshaft and different type of cooling, with all of it being pretty much confirmed by the pictures of the parts we got recently, we can safely conclude that the A85 is not a copy of the SLA-16. It is a very different design, with the only major connection between the two being the unique X layout. If anything, it borrows more from the Russian V2 engines than anything else. And now to go back on the oil station thing. The top of our article wrote that the engine was actually made to power oil stations. Well, it wasn't. The only source mentioning oil stations is a brochure from the manufacturer stating it is one of the possible applications, nothing else. 
Well done, since the A85 or the 2V12 is not a copy of the SLA-16 and it wasn't actually made for oil stations, what are its origins? Well, as it turns out, Soviets worked on X-layout diesels much before SLA-16 was a thing. In the late 1920s and the early 1930s, FED engines were developed for use in aviation and ground transports. The most successful one was the FED-3, which reached up to 1170 horsepower. This engine underwent trials in 1931, but because of a lot of issues which would have been too costly and time-consuming to resolve, the development stopped. There was a more powerful 2000 horsepower variant that also had some success, the FED-8, but in 1937 it also met the same fate. Between 1948 and 1950, after World War II and this time after the SLA-16, another X-layout diesel was developed, the M305, but this one was specifically designed for heavy aircrafts. It featured 7 cylinders in each bank, meaning it had 28 cylinders, so it was a pretty big engine. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any pictures of it, so it's hard to tell how it actually looked, since the project was cancelled and the development of the engine stopped. But its story didn't end there. You see, this was an opposed piston engine, and they made a one-cylinder variant, no longer X layout, named U305, which could produce 350 horsepower. This served as the basis for the future development of the 4TD and more famous 5TD engine that would power the T64 and later evolve into the 6TD engine that would power the upload tanks. So yeah, as it turns out, Soviets were no strangers to an X layout engine. SLA-16 wasn't anything that would revolutionize their way of thinking. It was just another X layout engine that was an already known technology at the time, since X engines had been developed in other countries as well, just not specifically for tanks. Now, there is a big misconception about the history of the A85 engine, or rather, a big mix-up. The story goes that the engine was developed during the 70s and showed great promise since it was more powerful than even the gas turbines at the time. But the development of the engine was forbidden by the Minister of Defense Industry at the time and no further development of the engine took place. Well, that is not really true. I mean, it is true, it is just a story of a completely different engine. You see, the mix-up stems from both of these engines having the same designation, a designation that I refused to use until now, 12 Che N 15 16. This name is often used for the A85 engine, because that is one of its actual designations, but that is also a designation for another engine, a V layout engine. I myself fell for this originally, thought that they simply stopped developing the engine for a decade and then went back to it, but no, the story is about a V layout engine that an author of one book describes as an analog to the German MTU MB873 the Leopard 2 engine. Well, there are some similarities between them, especially at the first glance, calling it an analog is a bit of an exaggeration. Now why do those two engines have the same name? Well, that is because each number and the letter in the designation marks something about the engine. 12 is the number of cylinders. Ch stands for Chetiri, which is a number 4 in Russian, indicating it's a 4-stroke engine. N stands for Naduv, which means a supercharger, meaning that the engine is supercharged. 15 stands for the cylinder bore diameter in centimeters and 16 stands for stroke length in centimeters. So the designation basically means 12 cylinder, 4 stroke, supercharged engine with 150 mm bore diameter and stroke length of 160 mm. That is what caused the confusion and why it led some people to believe that this story is actually about the A85 engine. In actuality, the 12 cylinder 2V engine A85 wasn't ready until mid to late 80s and the story of the 2V family rather starts with a 16-cylinder variant. In the early 70s, the decision was made to develop a unified family of engines that would serve for both heavy and light military vehicles. And at the time, the 2V series of engines were being developed in the Chelyabinsk plant. The project was led by Vladimir Ivanovich Butov. The basis for all designs would be the 16-cylinder X-layout diesel engine named 2V16, a 12-cylinder X-layout and more conventional 8-cylinder and 6-cylinder variant would be designed, but they would not be developed just yet. The priority was placed on the 16-cylinder X-layout engine, and in the period between 1976 and 1978, three 2V16-1 engines producing 1000 horsepower would be made. In November of 1976, using the 2V16-1 engine, the MTU-1 power pack would be made for use in tanks. 
Initially intended for the T80, Chelyabinsk first tested these on a T72 platform. Then they were tasked with developing a more powerful variant as a backup. By that, they probably wanted a more powerful variant to power possibly heavier tanks in the future. The 2V16 II, now able to produce 1200 horsepower, was developed as a result. This engine was tested in the Object 219RD, which is a modified T80B tank. The engine required an extension on the hull in order to fit it, since it was larger and required big radiators for cooling. The testing showed promising results, but also some glaring flaws, mainly with the heating, especially in hot weather. The engine was put aside for the T80 since Omsk Transmaj, the manufacturer of the T80 tanks, was more focused on development of their own gas turbine engines, but the engine was far from abandoned. It was tested again on Object 186. Both the MTU-1 with the 2V16-1 and the MTU-2 with the 2V16-2 were tested on this tank. The trials of this tank took place between 1985 and 1987 and showed mixed results. The engine was powerful, but once again showed some big issues. The problem again was heat. The engine had a tendency to overheat, but on top of that, the fuel consumption was also noticeably higher than the diesel engines used on T-72 tanks at the time. There were many attempts to fix the issues, and they were somewhat mitigated, but not completely ironed out. Nevertheless, they decided that the development of this engine needs to be finished by the end of 20th century, and the engine was actually recommended for mass production in 1988. What was probably planned was to set up the production and at the same time slowly iron out the issues during a low-rate initial production of the engines, but that never came to be. It was recommended sometime in 1986 that they go with the 12-cylinder variant, because a smaller engine would be easier to cool and would have better fuel economy, and it would also remove the need for a hull extension, which could have caused issues when traversing certain obstacles. They also planned to make it produce 1200 horsepower, and thus the suggestion for production did not go anywhere and the 16-cylinder 2V16 was abandoned in favor of the smaller 2V12. Unfortunately, the development of this engine did not garner much support, and on top of that, the development was slow and did not have big priority, especially since the Ukrainian 60D engine was chosen for use in the diesel variant of the T80, the T80UD, so the need for a new engine was not seen as a priority at the time, but the slow development process could also be blamed on the Chelyabinsk themselves. In July of 1989, a meeting was held to decide on what engine would be chosen for future use in the USSR, and according to Ryazantsev's book, it went something like this. Butov, the designer of the engine, and now a head designer at Chelyabinsk, presented the case for the 2V12 engine. He stated that the choice needs to be made between the Ukrainian 60D and the 2V12. He said that six 2V12 engines have been made so far, three of which have been tested on T-72s and reached a lifespan between 110 and 190 hours, which is pretty decent. In comparison, the predecessor of 6TD, the 5TD, originally had between 80 and 90 hours lifespan back in 1964 when it was new. Of course, the lifespan was drastically increased over time, but I'm just giving you something to compare those hours to. Putov was then told by the head of the main agency of automobiles and tanks of the Ministry of Defense, Alexander Garkin, that regardless of the tests, the 2V12 has not passed any official trials and that they would need to test them in 20 tanks at least in order to have any proper results. And that in comparison, the 60D engines have already been in active service since 1986 and have already proven themselves, so the choice is obvious. The meeting was then apparently finished without any conclusion. There was no second meeting because soon after, the USSR collapsed, so there was no reason to discuss which engine would be used in a country that no longer exists. So now, Russia no longer had access to the 60D engines, therefore one would assume they would place priority on developing the 2V12, but that was not really the case. From what I found, Russians mainly wanted to improve the performance of the already existing V2 series of engines, because it would be much more cost effective, and thus didn't really focus all that much on developing a new engine, which was already progressing slowly. But that doesn't have to mean they abandoned it. In July of 1990, the 2V12-2 engine was tested on the promising Object 187 tank, after a 1000 horsepower V2 engine variant, the V85 was already tested on it. The engine was tested on a couple of tanks, and on at least one of them passed 12,000 kilometers, 
The other 187 with this engine was tested in the period between April of 1992 and January 1993, and it worked for 370 hours and passed 6400 kilometers on the trial. Pretty decent for a relatively young engine, but keep in mind that this is a total distance traveled. We do not have any details on the amount of problems that occurred during the trials. The improved variant, A85-3 engine, would then get chosen to be used in the new Object 195 tank, which is a predecessor to the tank most famous for using this engine, the T-14 Armata. In the meantime, the development of the more powerful V-2 engine was at the full swing, and during the late 90s, the V-92 1000 horsepower engine would be developed. This engine would first enter service with the Indian T-90s in 2002, and then it would enter service in Russia in 2004 on the T-90A tank. Object 195 would be developed during the 90s, and two tanks would be completed by the end of 2001. In 2002, the trials began with a small demonstration where one tank fired three shots and drove around for a bit. But for the entire trial period that lasted a couple of years, one tank would drive a total of 15,000 kilometers and fire 287 shots from the 152mm main gun. Unfortunately, there is no information for the second one. The tank was actually recommended for mass production, with the planned production rate of 100 tanks in 2006 and 300 by the end of 2007. Pretty optimistic in my opinion. The trials were suspended in December of 2008 and the project officially cancelled in 2010. And as we all know, the project would evolve into the T-14 Armata, keeping many things from the Object 195, including the A85-3 engine. But what is happening with the engine? Well, this is where we now get to the future of the engine. Many in Russia have actually been arguing against the use of this engine in T-14 Armata, main reasons being that it is old, considering it was developed over 30 years ago at this point, and that it won't be powerful enough for future use if some design changes end up in the tank gaining weight. Which are all valid points. On top of that, not all problems with the engine have been fully ironed out. We will go into that in a bit. But considering all of this, the Ministry of Defense did actually task Chelyabinsk to develop a new engine for T-14 Armata. The engine was nicknamed Chaika and was, from what I could find, a more powerful V-layout engine. But they were slow with the development and failed to deliver it in time. And the funds for the development were pulled and the project cancelled, leaving T-14 without a more promising engine. Now, it has been 9 years since the T-14 Armata has been unveiled to the public, and it is still not in active service. Moreover, the problems with the engine have apparently not been fully ironed out either. On the 11th of September 2023, we would get reports on how the Russians admitted the failure of development of the engine, citing a report from the Russian Scientific and Technical Conference that took place in April of 2023. But the thing is, that is not really true. I do have the report from the conference, and the section about the engine is not saying that. In the report, there are a lot of theory sections, where some scientists, engineers, etc. present some of their theories, and the section about the A85-3A, or 2V12-3A, is labeled just that, theory. Now I'm going to basically sum up what they are saying. In the report, they are saying that the engine is an old, somewhat outdated design, that they cannot expect nowhere near the production rates as the production rates of the V2 type engines, and that the demand would probably be higher than the Chelyabinsk could probably be able to produce. They are also saying that some of the issues, after all these years, have not yet been completely ironed out. They are saying that 1500 horsepower is not enough, since more power would probably be required in the future. Another big issue is that the V2 engines have reached the peak with the 1130 horsepower V92 S2F and that nothing more can be expected from them, that Russia needs a new engine that they could reliably use in 30 to 40 years. Then they suggest a new engine be developed, a V layout engine that would be producing 1700 horsepower and 6000 Nm of torque, with efforts to make it fuel efficient and last 2000 hours before a major overhaul. Pretty demanding requirements, especially considering that the Chelyabinsk plant failed to develop a V-layout engine just a couple of years ago. Now, a lot of what they said was pretty valid criticism, and I have to agree with that. This engine should have entered service at least a decade ago, but would have been better if it entered service in the early 2000s, but it hasn't. Right now, it is old. It has been over 30 years, hell, maybe even 40, since it was developed, and even more since the initial design. But none of this is an admission of failure or anything similar as some people were saying. 
Now, shortly after that, it was actually announced that the Chelyabinsk managed to iron out the problems that the A85-3A had, and that it is now ready for serial production. Question is, how true is that? Keep in mind that this report came just days after the details of this conference were published, so it is kinda suspicious. But even so, there has been more media coverage from the state media about the engine, including the recent one where they showed the parts of the engine, and that was like a month ago. So the engine was definitely not abandoned, nor cancelled, nor anything else some people were allowed to believe. But I do believe that the criticism provided at the conference is still very valid. If we take away the, oh, there are still some problems that need to be ironed out part, there is still a lot left. A lot that simply cannot be addressed with fixing some small design issues. Is the Chelyabinsk plant actually capable of producing this engine at any nominal rate? Can this engine be powered up for future use? When will we actually see any serial production to begin with? It all remains to be seen. And until then, I do believe that some skepticism is valid, and I do believe that maybe finding a different solution would be a better idea. But who knows, maybe they will prove everyone wrong and actually manage to set up proper production and show the world that they are actually capable. We shall see. That would be all for this kinda lengthy video. It did take me a while to make this one, since the more information I was digging for, the more I was uncovering, and deciding what to keep and what to take out was also a pain, since keeping everything in would have me ramble for hours. Anyway, I will have the services in the description, and if you wish to support me, you can do so on Patreon. Thank you all very much for watching, and I will see you all in the next video. Have a nice day. Yeah.